Okay. Thank you very much for energy. So uh, I'm very happy to have uh, be here and present this work. So uh, you know, this is uh, reshaping adolescent gender attitude is something that I've been working on for a long time now. So it's been about plus, plus, more than 10 years that I've been working on this with uh, Deva Dhar, who's now a PhD student at Oxford University, and Seema Jaitanya, who's at Princeton. So um, the a couple of caveats on this project. So uh, I'm going to talk about my you know research journey on this. Uh, there is some elements of this paper with, uh, of this project that are already published, and so you know you can go on my website and look at papers that have already been published. But the project itself goes on, so we're actively collecting data <laughs> right now. And so we have suggestions on you know, hey, I wish you would have collected data on this topic. You know, that, I really love those suggestions because we can actually go out and do that. Plus, the other caveat is that we're a very open uh, source kind of project, right? So if you say that uh, you want our data and you want our questionnaires or whatever you want, uh, I'm more than happy to share those with you. Uh, my, much of that you don't even have to ask me. I've already put it online. But uh, if there's uh, you know new upcoming data that you would like to access before we uh, release it to the world, uh, just shoot me an email, and I'm more than happy to do that. So. Um, that having been said, um, you know, I think uh, gender attitudes is the sort of topic which uh, cuts across many social science disciplines. Uh, even though we talk about India, uh, I don't think this is a topic which is restricted to India. It's sort of you know more global uh, and more universal. So um, I'm happy to have feedback from your diff uh, you know different perspectives uh, for this project. And so you know I have my notebook right here, uh, and hopefully uh, this will be a constructive conversation. As we as she said, hold your substantive comments to the end. But you know if you have something that's burning, it's really sitting and you can't wait till the end, I'm more than happy to listen to you. Okay, so uh, that having been said, uh, let's just uh, talk about what this project is about. Here's one slide on it. Uh, you know, this uh, topic starts as uh, the fact that India has severe gender inequality. Um, so this is not a very, you know, this is a very expansive statement. Um, so gender inequality in India sort of you know, starts um, sort of early in life. So there's this uh, sex ratio which many people track. Uh, in Haryana state, it used to be 1.2 uh, boys for every girl. So that is quite uh, imbalanced. But uh, you know, you can think of gender inequality as sort of a life cycle thing, right? So you start at birth, you st look at things like uh, you know infant mortality rates, which are you know under one the mortality rates. You think about access to health and education. Uh, many people have documented that. You look at things like you know. Uh, attaining college uh, right now, the female labor force participation rate is uh, you know in focus because that's very low. Uh, but then you also think about career and you know life cycle opportunities throughout the life cycle. And then there's the other domain of marriage and childbearing where there's a lot of inequality. And so the, sort of this extends to you know even later years. And so uh, this there is gender inequality in India. Uh, Haryana is perhaps ground zero for the state of Haryana is perhaps ground zero for some of this. Uh, but this is not just a uh, Haryana thing. This is not just an Indian thing. You will see gender inequality sort of around the world, right? So, um, uh, so this is uh, you know something that many people recognize. So I'm not the only person to say this. Uh, many people recognize this. Uh, scholars across different disciplines have looked at it, but also in the policy realm, there's a lot of awareness of this issue. And uh, you see many initiatives to address specifically gender inequality in different domains, right? So, uh, so lots of these policies have been tried, and I would say with varying success. What this means is that you know there's reasonable social science uh, research out there which points to the fact that many policies have been effective, right, on the margin. So, if you think about you know this much uh, much studied uh, resignation for women in uh, local uh, local elections. Uh, you'll see that you know there are high quality research papers that have gone out and said, look, this works in improving governance, in gaining access for women, being role models, so on and so forth. So in that sense, on the margin, uh, many of these policies are a success, right? But um, you know, I think the other point we had to say is that has the problem been solved? And in that sense, we say no, it hasn't, right? So, so uh, that's where the varying success part comes from. Uh, for specifically the skewed sex ratio, people try out different things. For example, uh, you know, if you have uh, you know shortage of girls, let's give p uh, parents money to have girls, right? So this is a conditional cash transfer uh, view of the world. That why don't we give fi financial incentives to have daughters invest in them, have them complete schools, so on and so forth. Um, 
uh, there's this famous ban on sex selective abortion that has been there since the 1990s, and so that has had some e effect, uh, some direct effects, some perverse effects, and people have looked at some of those ones. Right? So, um, so this is you know sort of uh, the space over here, which is I can talk on and on about other people's work. But I want to talk about specific, something very specific, which is about Haryana, right? So the Haryana government, so Haryana is a place where you see a lot of uh, both patriarchal attitudes, but also you know very skewed outcomes for girls versus boys. And so it's not as if the government wasn't aware of this; they know that they have a problem, and they reached out to us saying that, look, should we try and you know giving parents money to have daughters and send them to school or something like that? And we said, you know, there are varying degrees to which those policies have been successful. And we don't really think that that is the best use of your money, right? Um, and instead, what we were, uh, you know, we were motivated by is the social science uh, uh, literature that said that, look, there's some degree to which you have an underlying social problem, right? So if I use the language of economics, um, what financial incentives do is that they change your uh, budget constraint, right? So they change the prices. So giving money means that it's more valuable to have girls. It's basically putting a price on girls, right? And so instead, what you want to do is to cheat, underline basically people's underlying preferences. Do you value your girls as much as you value your girls? And so there was some social science research out there in economics that said that maybe it's possible to change attitudes around those questions. And so some of this had to do with local panchayat leaders, some of this had to do with watching cable TV, right? So uh, India, expanded, India introduced cable TV, uh, lots of villagers saw uh, women in urban areas going out to work and getting an education and being bold and speaking up, and uh, maybe that changed attitudes. And so we said that, look, could you be uh, much more, but that was almost like an incidental outcome of cable TV. No one, in, you know, no one introduced cable TV for women's involvement. People introduce cable TV to make money off of you know advertising revenues. So, uh, but could you be much more deterministic about it, and could you actively change gender attitudes in a you know sort of a more programmatic way? And particularly since the part of the Haryana government that we were talking to was the education department, the question was, can we use the school curriculum right, um, to go out and uh, address gender attitudes? in a very deterministic way, and perhaps change them at a time when kids are open to that change. And so that is basically the project and saying that, can you actually achieve this? Uh, is this even possible, or is it somewhat of a pipe? So this is the uh, focus of this project. Um, so uh, to be more specific, you know, can you think about and discuss uh, questions of gender gaps and, um, and think about why this is the case? and make the, uh, both the human rights case as well as a very pragmatic case for closing those gender gaps, right? So why should we close gender gaps in society? Because it's the right thing to do. That's one argument for it. The other is you know, a basic economic argument. So if uh, women go out to work, there's more money in the house. And so that's a very pragmatic way of thinking about it. And so could you have this, uh, you know, sort of thinking about and discussing these, uh, uh, having these discussions, uh, change and notice and gender attitudes and hopefully their behavior as well, right? So this is the uh, hope that we have. And so what we did is to propose an intervention which focused on both boys and girls in secondary schools, uh, particularly grades 7, 8, 9, 10 in Haryana uh, government schools, right? And so the approach was to have uh, curricular activities. I'll tell you much more about these curricular activities, um, which are embedded in the school day. So it's not an out-of-school program. It's a within the school program. Uh, so kids have to attend because, you know, just the way you have to attend science class and maths class, you have to attend this class as well. Um, once every three weeks for a long time. So this is not like showing one movie and we think that, you know, watching one movie will change gender attitudes forever. This is uh, hitting kids with these curricular lessons for a long time to come for two and a half years, right? So. So we decided to run this program, but we think that uh, the targeting is reasonable. So um, we are running this program amongst adolescents and in schools, uh, but there is specific reasons for this. So uh, why adolescents? Well, you know, one thing is that adolescents have fairly malleable views. So any so social science research, so particularly from psychology, tells you who you are at twenty is pretty much who you will be for the rest of your life. So it's very difficult to change people once they attain adulthood. 
So, okay, fine, if it, adults are difficult to change, why don't we go uh, and talk to kids who are much, uh, you know, earlier age? And so we decided on adolescence uh, because this is a time when views are very malleable, right? And this is also an age when kids are naturally interested in the other gender. So if you go back to like seven-year-olds, well, seven-year-olds might not understand the issues that you're talking about, but 12, 13, 14 years old, uh, they're very curious and are they actually able to address these issues, right? So they're mature enough to debate these issues. Uh, the second reason is that schools are actually a place where policy can be effective. So you say that we have a house-based, home-based program. I mean, at the home, you're, you know, there's not so much of a compelling case for the state to come in and uh, talk about you know all these issues. But in the school where the state is anyway running these public schools, there's a reasonable case to be made about why you should be um, addressing these things and counterbalance the messages that kids might get from the home or the community. Right? The third reason why we think it's good targeting is because it's very cost effective. Now you might be shocked at this because I'm going to tell you about like, all the costs that we incurred, the rupee costs that we incurred in running this program. Um, but if you look at it from another perspective, that if you can, you know, remember I told you that who you are in 20 is who you will be for the rest of your life? Well, compared to, so if you change kids' attitudes at a fairly young age, and then those attitudes get locked in, how long do you think the impacts of this program will last? Your entire life, right? So if you fundamentally change who someone is at 20, the impacts of the program will be, you know, amortized over a very long time period. So in that sense, you know, the returns on the program can be quite high. The other reason is that you know, uh, there are ways to think about scaling up the program. So I'm going to tell you what happened in this program. It's fairly rupee intensive, but now that we've been through a couple of cycles of this program, and uh, this is now entering the policy realm, I'll tell you a little bit about how this can go to scale at fairly low price, right? At low, fairly low costs. Um, so taught by the school teachers and then and so now it becomes much more effective, and it can be done at far larger scale than what we're going to describe. Only uh, 300 schools, right? We're going to take it to tens of thousands of schools, and then let's see, think about how you can change this. So, any questions at this point? No questions? Okay, great. All right, so what is this intervention that I'm talking about? Uh, well, uh, first is that the economists were not involved in actually running the intervention for two and a half years. Instead, we went out and uh, we're, uh, you know, engaged in organization called Breakthrough. So um, if you have, uh, if you can go on YouTube and Breakthrough became fairly f uh, famous for its Bel Bajau program. So young people in the audience might have heard about Bel Bajau, which is an anti-domestic virus uh, campaign. So uh, Breakthrough is a uh, gender rights, uh, a gender and human rights organization based in Delhi, uh, as well as in New York. And so they're very savvy, right? They're very, you know, th going to YouTube uh, Breakthrough is like meeting a lot of cool people. So they're very savvy on media, they know what kids want, all that stuff. Which is exactly the sort of people that you want talking to kids, right? So these are teenagers. And so you don't want like you know uncle aunties uh, going and like lecturing to your kids like you should have gender equality. Instead, uh, you want young people who understand how you know thirteen-year-olds talk and thirteen-year-olds uh, behave in order to actually change them. So uh, they had twenty-seven classroom sessions over two and a half years, um, and so they you know hired a lot of facilitators. So these facilitators are expensive um, to actually go out and lead discussions and activities in school. And I'll tell you a little bit about what these discussions. So what are the session topics? Well, they're gender-related attitudes, gender differences and aspirations, division of work, attitudes of work, tolerance of discrimination, communication skills, etc. But these are just social science words. So this will be never actually used any of this language. And so let's think about what actually happened in some of these sessions. Well, there's a lot of discussions, right? So, um, so uh, for example, a discussion might be about what do you want to be when you grow up? So write it down. So all the boys write, pilot, engineer. And all the girls write, pilot, engineer. And then the facilitator says, let's talk about what you just wrote. So the boys discover that the girls had very similar aspirations as they did, and the girls discover that the boys had very similar aspirations as they did. Right? So uh, you know, without that discussion, you always think of the other as some you know, weird person who doesn't have the same aspiration as you do. But this discussion helps to reveal that people are you know, very similar in their aspirations. Or a uh, discussion could be uh, things like uh, you know household chores. So who cooks at home? Mama cooks at home. Uh, but uh, 
who cooks uh, in a restaurant? It's a man who cooks in a restaurant, right? And so, you know, through this discussion, it comes about, like, you know, why is it that men uh, cook in a restaurant but women cook at home? And so, to what extent do paid activities versus unpaid activities play out in this realm? So, we're talking a lot about these, you know, these are the kinds of discussions that the children, or that the students are having with the facilitators and amongst themselves. Okay. Um, so, this is a, a discussion on household terms. Here's another one, right? So, it's sexual harassment. So. Uh, Breakthrough loves making cartoons. They love making comics. So underline this point. Kids love comics, right? They will read comics all day long. They'll watch cartoons all day long. And so a lot of your messaging that they had had to uh, you know, use the medium of comics, use multimedia in order to make uh, a point. And so this is like a you know, comic book that they came up with, which is about sexual harassment and having kids uh, you know, talk to their own peers about sexual harassment. Um, there are a lot of other activities, so for example, uh, many of the students had very, very poor communication skills, especially when they're talking to their parents. So you know, we talk to kids about gender attitude and gender equality, and then if the parents, you know, if the kids go home and then they talk to the parents about this, and the parents don't understand what their kids are talking about, um, you know, then there won't be a lot of change in society because the parents are ultimately controlling them. So uh, we talk a lot about communication skills. There's a lot of mixing that happens in these programs. So um, I think the ex ante experience of most girls and most boys are that, look, uh, these are co-ed schools, but effectively they're segregated. The boys sit on one side, the girls sit on another. And the girls won't really have a lot of experience in talking to boys or interacting with them. So the only experience that a girl might have is that a boy like you know touches her tupatta or you know cat calls or something like that. So the ex ante experiences of girls are also not very positive. So they don't want to talk to boys. And the only language that boys have of talking to girls is what they see on TV, what they see in the movies. So they also they also don't know how to talk to girls. So uh, this uh, program you know has a lot of these communication skills, how to talk to your parents, how to talk to your other gender, stuff like that. Mm. There's things like street plays. Um, so I, this is these are sorry generic images. I don't have actual program participant images, uh, but um, so they have uh, street plays stuff. Uh, you know that kids can write at the end of the program. They write scripts on gender equality, and they then produce the plays themselves and talk, uh, you know uh, in their own schools. So in that sense, these are all you know examples of uh, uh, the discussions that are happening over two and a half years. So any questions about the intervention? No questions? Is it clear what's happening? Okay. <laughs> yes. So it was mainly the facilitators from Breakthrough that were leading these conversations. Yeah, not yeah. The yeah, not the school teachers. So typically, mm -hmm. uh, Breakthrough would ask every school to nominate a teacher who is sort of their uh, you know, liaison. And the schools were very selective. So typically, it would be a very popular teacher, like a physical education teacher who is being nominated, or it's some female teacher who's very sort of gung-ho about women's rights or something like that. And so they are uh, nominating those teachers. And the teachers go through like a one-day training. But that's about it. So uh, in this version of the program, that's all that's happening. Uh, so the teachers will typically be participating along with the students. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit more about at the end, when we take it to the policy realm, what's happening. So is it uh, that the same facilitator engages with a uh, group of students over the two years, or? Yeah, yeah. And so uh, the facilitators tend to be relatively young people. So think of like recent college graduates in their early 20s, early to mid 20s. So they are relatively young. Um, out of eight facilitators, seven were men. And so this is also the reality of gender discrimination in Haryana's labor market that Breakthrough is hiring from, is that for them to hire female facilitators was very difficult. So, uh, so that's just how it is, yeah. I have the question you answered, like yeah. how many were men and how many were Yeah, seven were men and one was women. So, any other questions? No questions? Okay, great. So, uh, all right, so what is, uh, so this is, uh, so until now I've described Breakthrough's work. What is our work? Is that we are going to evaluate this using an RCT design, right? And so uh, this is uh, where the uh, program is being conducted. It's being conducted in four districts around Delhi. So this is so, uh, uh, this is uh, Pinipat, Sonipat, Rotak, and Chacha. 
and so this is Delhi over here. So these are the four districts with the most skewed sex ratio in Haryana. So uh, this is where Haryana government wanted us to work. Uh, there are 314 secondary schools with the appropriate number of students in uh, the appropriate grades in these four districts. So we decided to work with all of 314 schools. So what we did is we randomly allocated uh, this, uh, the treatment schools, 150 of the treatment schools, and 164 control schools. And so you can see where are the treatment schools and where are the control schools. I mean, I did the randomization, so you know, it's random. Okay, so uh, 215 of these schools are co-ed, and 99 are single sex. But the co-ed schools you can think of as functionally uh, single sex because they really don't mix. So girls and boys really don't mix in, in the schools. And the study is designed to follow the sample for many years. So uh, within this uh, sample is about 40,000 is the number of students who are enrolled. Um, now we select 15,000 of those students for our sampling strategy, those are the students we interview and get data from. Um, but uh, so we're going to set up a panel, a baseline uh, that we conducted between in 2013 14. And so about 15,000 students we interviewed at that time. And we've been following them for many years. Right? So uh, the uh, intervention, the two and a half year intervention lasted from 2014 to 2016. The intervention ends. We immediately do the first endline survey. Two years later, we do a second endline survey. And now, 2022, we're on our third endline survey. And so uh, we're going back and creating the uh, panel of the same kid over and over again. A couple of additional uh, surveys we did at baseline, we also surveyed 40% of the parents. So we went home to the kids and randomly picked a father or a mother, and we surveyed uh, those people folks as well. Uh, in this end line, two, these two end lines, we only surveyed the students. And then finally, in this end line, we're surveying a parent again, plus we're surveying a younger sibling. Right. So this is the uh, design that we're setting up. So uh, now we uh, can not only look at the impact on attitudes and be immediate behaviors, but we can also take a look at uh, completed schooling, age of marriage, female employment, sex ratio of parts with children, so on and so forth, because now, about 10 years later, the students are actually at an age and they're starting to have lots of kids. So this is the design that we're looking at. So uh, folks who just came in, uh, I'm going to, should I give a background on what are, what's happening? Um, I have read the paper. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So this is the specification. There are no fireworks here. Basically, it's a standard difference in difference. So we are going to control, compare uh, the treatment schools to the control schools before and after. Okay. So we are going to look at right now uh, on three outcome variables. We're going to look at attitudes, aspirations, and behaviors. So attitudes are basically a kind of lot of eating questions towards gender equality in education, employment, gender roles, and fertility behavior, right? Um, the girls' asp aspirations are only for girls. So we're not looking at boys' aspirations. Boys' aspirations are sky high. <laughs> Everyone wants to be an uh, IAS officer. So there is no, you know, so there is nothing to look at over there. Uh, girls' aspirations is what we look at. Um, and gender behavior, this is looking at stuff which uh, can actually meaningfully change at that age, right? So stuff like, uh, and this is gender. So for example, do boys do household chores much more? Do girls uh, go to the market by themselves much more? So stuff like that. And so this is what we're going to look at um, in this question as an outcome here. So any questions at this point? Right. So this is the most important results slide. So if you pay attention to nothing else, please pay attention over here. So this is the main result. So first is gender attitude. We change gender attitudes by 0.18 standard deviations. This is a lot. And I'll tell you in half a minute why this is a lot. We had no impact on aspirations. So it turns out not only are boys' aspirations sky high, girls' aspirations are also sky high. These are the four districts in the media market right next to Delhi. Every girl is going to be an engineer. Every girl is going to get an MBA. Every girl is going to be a civil service. Right? So, uh, in the sense, there's no impact on aspirations. I'm not going to talk about aspirations anymore. Uh, there's no impact on aspirations. Third result, behavior changed a lot. 
And so I'll tell you why I think that these uh, impacts are pretty large. Okay. So think about why is it that I'm saying that 0.18 standard deviations is a big impact. But big impact compared to what? Right? So here's one way to think about it. What is the impact of parents on the child attitudes, right? So remember at baseline we went and interviewed their parents and interviewed the parents' attitudes? So now what we can do is to look at the impact of parent attitudes on the child's attitudes. Now those parents have been influencing the kids their entire life. This program has just been there for you know number of sessions for two and a half years. So which program, which has had a bigger effect? The parents or the program? The program had one and a half times larger effect than the parents' attitudes, right? So that is big in, in that sense, right? So that's a benchmark. Another way to think about this is the girl-boy attitude gap. So women in general, around the world, in every society, are much more equality-oriented than men. This is just a fact. And this is true even in this sample. That if you go and talk to girls and say, should there be equality in society? Yes, of course. And if you talk to boys, well, let's think about that, right? So <laughs> girls and boys in inherently have different views on gender equality uh, in every society, including this. So how big is this gap? It's 0.5 standard deviations. So one way to think about this is to look at this gap and say that the program narrowed down these gaps by about a third which, you know, my subjective uh, opinion is that it's a lot, but you know, this is one way to benchmark. These are two ways to benchmark how big these effect sizes are. Okay? And we have, you can also think about persuasion rate. So some, you know, persuasion rates in political science literature basically is on these surveys about attitudes, how many questions did you manage to set? And so that's a lot. Okay, so the obvious heterogeneity that you want to look at is boys versus girls. Right? So these are, these are combined boys versus girls outcomes. But um, let's think about attitude change for uh, boys versus girls. So it turns out that boys and girls have pretty much the same gender attitude changes. Right? So 0.18 is the mean effect, 0.2, uh, 0.2 standard deviations for boys, and 0.16 for girls. But there's a big difference in behavior. So attitudes changed about the same, but behavior changed much more for the boys than it did for the girls. And so uh, the behavior is uh, much uh, is different. Uh, so why would that be? So one answer is that you know boys become much more equality oriented in their attitudes. Now you want to take your attitudes and convert them into behavior. But boys also have much more agency within the house. If a boy wants to start doing more chores, what do parents say? Sure. But now the girl wants to take her better atti equal attitudes and convert them into different behavior. Now she wants to go outside the house. And mama's attitudes are still restricting her from actually translating her uh, attitudes into behavior. So, uh, you know, 0.14 standard deviations is still quite a bit, but it's still half of that of the boys. So, you know, double the impact of the boys than it is on the girls. So, you know, when we think about long term change, I would speculate that the biggest beneficiary of this program might be the wives of these boys. Because insofar that the practical reality is that boys and men have more agency in society, uh, the biggest beneficiaries might be the women there. Okay, okay so uh, one interesting uh, uh, survey um, uh, aspect of this is social desirability bias. You go around asking people, should there be equality in society? And what does everyone say? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. And especially if you right after you put them into a program, we talked about equality in society, and then at the end you survey the, the respondents, and everyone is going to give you socially desirable answer, either to look good to the surveyor or to themselves. And so, uh, you know, what we did in order to uh, we anticipated this. So, in order to overcome some of these issues, one uh, thing we did is to uh, use a tool which was developed by social psychologists a long time ago, right? So, Crown Marlowe has been around since 1960. And so, what this module does is it's a validated module, um, which basically, you know, this I'm just giving you examples of, uh, you know, the elements in that uh, module is to, you know, ask at baseline whether someone tends to give socially desirable answers or not. To what kind of question? So it is sometimes hard for, uh, for me to go on with my work if I'm not encouraged. And if you always say, no, no, I'm very self-motivated, uh, you might be the sort of person who tends to get socially desirable. 
about them, right? Or so there have been times when I was quite jealous of the good fortune of others. I'm always willing to admit it when I make a mistake. I am always courteous even to people who disagree. So if you tend to agree with all these questions, you might be the sort of person who tends to give socially desirable answers, right? So we uh, have been able to type, you know, type everyone uh, according to the crown model module, and so. Um, what we found out is that, of course, you know, people who tend to do this tend to have worse attitudes in general, but there's no impact of this on the treatment effects, right? So the program, so your responsiveness to the program itself is not a function of this. So uh, we might, you know, this uh, gives us more confidence that we might have actually not so much of a social desirability problem. Uh, so we did, uh, you know, this is one innovation that we've done and happy to share our, you know, Haryana specific crown model uh, module with you if you like uh, in, for any of your research. Okay, so uh, this was not enough. So N line one was in uh, 2016. This was not enough because people said, well, you know, it's just at the end of the program. You tell people you should have social, you know, gender equality in society, and then you go and interview them, and what does everyone say? Yes, of course, there is. You, they might just remember the lessons from the uh, modules and not reflecting fundamental change. So we went back and interviewed all the students again, um, and so the treatment effects persisted at the same time. So uh, point one eight became point one six. I'm very happy with this. So imagine if you teach a class, you give students an exam at the end of the class. Of course, they all do well. But imagine without any like you know giving them any more lessons, you give them the same exam two years later. And they still score and remember 90% of what they learned in the class, right? So that's pretty good. Uh, so you know, a lot of these treatment effects persisted, and so this gives us more uh, confidence that this is reflecting actual attitude change rather than you know some other tendency to give answers. Uh, behavior change persisted as well, and so this is true. The same uh, you know split was there. So boys' attitudes in some ways much uh, stronger, so point two, two, uh, two zero became point two two. Uh, girls' attitudes slipped a little bit, uh, but the behavior split was still there, uh, even two years later, and in some ways much more pronounced than what it was supposed to be. So these are the uh, you know big effects. Uh, so I'm more than happy to talk about this uh, you know this rich set of uh, heterogeneity tests. Uh, there's no impact say by income or wealth levels. So you in, in, in so far that you're interested in that sample, but you know you can look, take a look at some of the other cards, co-ed versus single sex, so on and so forth. There's no really effects of that. So these are the main results that we have. Um, so what happened at the end of the program? So you know this is uh, very much in line with policymakers. Uh, we've done this at reasonably large scale that we can start to make, you know, socially, uh, I think social points over here, uh, policy points over here. So we went out, we, you know, put the paper out, working paper out. So we got some coverage, uh, for example, in the national press. We got some coverage in the international press. So that was good. I mean, you know, as researchers, this is also always what you want to tell the dean. That, Look, the economist is coming my paper. This is awesome, right? So this is the way. I think the more important uh, results came when, uh, so the program in Haryana sort of ended, right? So the intervention ended. We're still doing data collection in Haryana, but one of the problems in working with policymakers is that they get transferred out, right? So the chief secretary who we were working with, she got promoted up to the defense uh, uh, ministry. So the subsequent uh, secretaries weren't so interested in working on these programs. They had other priorities, so they shut the program down. There is no program in Haryana anymore. But someone else was listening. Right across the border in Punjab, the Punjab government said, look, this is a great program. And thanks for the RCT results. These are very compelling. And so they decided to implement this in all their schools. Now we're not just doing 150 treatment schools. We're doing every school uh, in Punjab. And so you know, in the sense, uh, you know, it's gender service rights, school curriculum. So now it's embedded in to this regular school curriculum. We don't need those fancy breakthrough teachers anymore, facilitators anymore. We, this is now part of the standard school uh, teachers and standard textbooks. And so they go through this over a, a long term, right? And so, so in the sense, this program has been scaled up to every kid in Punjab, and so hopefully down. And so now, um, earlier this year, in August this year, Orissa government themselves decided that they would implement this across 23,000 uh, 23, uh, uh, government schools, and so this is now in the realm of lakhs of students taking up the program, and so um, hopefully it will have some impact on some kids. Um, so you know, I don't think I'll ever get to meet any of these kids, but at least statistically, I'm happy that they're all now part of the treatment schools and not part of the control schools, right? So uh, that's about all I have. Uh, so if you wanted, uh, you know, it's still five minutes short on. Uh,
my time. So, but if I wanted to take away some lessons from this research, right? So, lessons from this research. The first is that you know, um, if you if you you know go if you look at the history of trying to change people's views, it's difficult to change people's views. So, politicians try to change their views all the time. Marketing, you know, advertising executives try to change their views all the time. Uh, but it's really difficult to do that. And so the number of instances of successfully trying to do that is fairly small. Now, the two examples that I have in school curriculum based are actually two negative examples. Right? So first uh, are uh, research based on Nazi ideology in Germany in the 1930s. And so the Nazis were successful in uh, changing uh, the views of kids who were in school at that time. And the second example I have is of the Chinese Communist Party changing this views of kids who are in Chinese uh, government schools. I hope that this is a little bit more positively oriented, right? So we're trying to do something similar, but we're trying to do it in a, you know, so for something which is desirable, which is gender equality. But ex ante, I would say that this is very difficult to do. Actually, you know, insofar that it's very difficult to convince adults of anything, uh, you know, we are somewhat fortunate that we were able to implement a program where we actually got some traction. So, large scale gender attitude change is possible in a deterministic way, so, and not just in an incident through, oh, we got lucky. Right? And the second is, lesson is target adolescents. So, give up on adults. So, if you want to change anything in society, adults are a lost cause. Young people, teenagers are who you want to get. Because teenagers are still open to changing their minds. But once, and the advantage of this approach is, so once you get teenagers to change their mind, they grow up to be the sort of adults who are more equality oriented, who are more you know, the, uh, socially oriented. The third lesson I'd say is that you know, girls face persistent challenges in taking their views into actual action. Right? So um, insofar that uh, you know, this is a still a binding constraint on the success of many programs, you have to be thinking about that and helping girls actually translate their views into some sort of uh, outcomes. But the final lesson is include boys in program. So a lot of women's empowerment program, gender equality programs, only target women. So there's violence on the streets. Let's teach women karate. And yeah, sure. But how about also talking about boys and men not to have boy violence in the streets, right? So uh, I think that this is uh, including boys in programming is quite important, uh, and it might be the key to long-term social change uh, because. Let's face it, men and boys still have a you know, lot of in society. So uh, these are my four lessons from this research.